as you, those who come regularly will know, our current series is rooted and um, it's based on the Bible verse Colossians 2, 6 and 7. We've reached today the part that is about being rooted in the Word of God. So that will be our theme today and next week's will be on rooted in thankfulness. Okay, so those verses, Colossians 2, 6 to 7. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him and let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. And particularly this week, we're looking at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realise what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. And Cecilia is going to speak to us on that theme. <laughs> Moment of panic when I couldn't see you. <laughs> Can I pray for you before we Lord, we do thank you so much for Cecilia and her lovely family. We thank you for the time she's put into preparing this for us. And we just pray now that your Holy Spirit will anoint what she's saying, direct her as she speaks, and keep all of our hearts open to your voice through her, that we might respond in obedience to you. Amen. Okay, good morning. good morning, and good morning to people that are going to be watching this on YouTube later. So as we've already said, this is the fourth in our Rooted series. Let me just see if I can work this. Is this forward or backwards? Switch it on. Oh, switch it on, that would help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just having a... Oh, brilliant, thank you. And um, the series has been based on these couple of verses from Colossians. So in week one, Andy took the first section and he was asking the question, are we rooted in Christ? Have we accepted Jesus as our Lord and Saviour? We were thinking about what that meant and each week we had a challenge. Week one's challenge was, how would you answer Jesus' question? Who do you say I am? Week two, Joss looked at the second part and we were thinking about being rooted in prayer. She asked, is prayer an integral part of your life? And the challenge was um, to become more aware of when you pray and how you pray and work towards living praying. Week three, was uh, last week and Guy was looking at being rooted by devotion. We were thinking about what it meant to be devoted to Christ but also to each other and our family challenge or hope challenge was to allow God to search you and to follow his promptings before you next take communion. And if you've missed any of those I'd encourage you to look those up on YouTube. If you're not quite sure how to do that just come and find me at the end and I'll point you in the right direction. Today, we're looking at this bit. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught. So sorry That's okay. Um, wardrobe malfunction. Oh, yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you for telling me. Thank you, thanks for stopping me. I had no idea, I would never have known. Okay, so I'll start that bit again. So we're looking at the bit in green today. <laughs> then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you were taught. And what I'm going to be talking about today is rooted in the word. Okay. When you become a Christian, 
It's the beginning of a journey. If you've accepted Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you are a child of God. You are adopted into his family. You're completely forgiven. You're restored and your freedom has been obtained. God now sees you as holy and blameless. You're a new person. You're a new creation. You have peace with God. You can go to him as you are. But you don't suddenly know everything. You're not in a position where you never make mistakes. And I get the sense of this journey from this passage. We continue to follow him. We let our roots grow, drag, grow down. We spend time in prayer. Christian maturity doesn't just happen over time. It happens with time with him. Growth time. How is your journey with Jesus? How has your faith matured over the last six months? Over the last one month? And then we have today's bit. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth that you have taught. During our Christian journey, when we are following him and our roots are growing down, how do we know the truth? Are our roots growing down in the right direction? Are we getting our substance from the correct places, from the correct sources? Are we seeking to learn from him and his teachings? How do you make decisions? How do you know what's right and wrong? How do you know what's true? Are you rooted in the word? I wondered if somebody asked you, what is the Bible? How would you answer them? Perhaps there's some here who might say, well, I think it might be a collection of fairy stories. Well, if that's the place, I'm free to chat afterwards, if you'd like to try and see that from another point of view. Maybe you might answer in a very theoretical way. Maybe you say something like, well, I think it's a collection of 66 books. It's split into the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's written by over 40 different authors from a variety of different backgrounds. They lived on three different continents over a time span of about 1,500 years. And while that's true, Paul says much more than that in our passage from 2 Timothy. It says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. So all scripture is inspired by God. Other translations say all scripture is breathed out by God or God breathed. It's the word of God himself. And although it was written by lots of different people over such a large time scale, it tells a consistent, unfolding story of salvation. It's a bit like a jigsaw that's been put together, but the people couldn't see other people's pieces or the final picture. Only God could, and now we can. It's like no other book in its consistency. And although the Bible, te Bible writers were using their own minds, their own talents, and their own writing styles, they wrote what God wanted them to. He was in control. He knew the bigger picture. And that's what gives the Bible its authority. It's like no other book in its ability to change lives. And I wonder whether you've experienced that for yourself. There's two functions of scripture here, to teach us what is true and to teach us what's right and wrong. I wonder how people decide what's true and what's moral nowadays. Perhaps 
people not as friends. Perhaps people turn to self-help books. Perhaps people Google. Or perhaps, like me, earlier this week, you turn to a chatbot like chat, chat GTP. I typed in, how do I decide what's right and wrong? It waffled on for a bit and then it said, remember that determining what is right or wrong can be a complex process and there may not always be a clear-cut answer. It's important to approach each situation with an open mind and to consider multiple perspectives before making a decision. I didn't find that particularly useful, so I then typed in, well, is morality objective? It then said, quite unhelpfully, ultimately, whether morality is objective or subjective may depend on one's personal beliefs and worldview. It's important to approach these debates with an open mind and a willingness to consider multiple perspectives and to use reason and evidence to support one's own beliefs and arguments. Hmm, okay. And if you put truth in, you basically get the same answer. So basically, you should do what you feel is best as long as you've thought about it. But as Christians, we want to follow Jesus. We want our roots to go down into him. We want to know what the truth is, not what our truth is. We want to know what we are doing is pleasing to him and not be self-serving, right? So let's see what Jesus does to explain what is right and wrong. In Matthew chapter 19, there's a conversation that Jesus has with a rich young man. I'll read from, chapter, from verse 17. Why do you ask me what is good? Jesus replied. There's only one who is good. But to answer your question, if you want to receive eternal life, keep the commandments. Which one? The man asked. Jesus replied, you must not murder, you must not commit adultery, you must not steal, you must not testify falsely, honour your father and mother, love your neighbour as yourself. I have obeyed all these commandments, the young man replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go, sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven, and then come follow me. Notice that when asked what was good, Jesus pointed him to the law. He did not say, consider multiple perspectives, use reason and evidence, and you can determine what is right for yourself. Jesus, who, rightly so, is seen as loving and compassionate, and a friend of sinners, looked to the Old Testament for his moral guide. We have a holy God in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I wonder if Jesus were to ask us the same questions, going through the commandments one at a time, how would you answer? Have you ever told a lie? Have you ever stolen anything? I hope I'm not coming across as too legalistic. I want to be clear, we are not saved by keeping the commandments. In Romans chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, it says, Obviously, the law applies to those to whom it was given, for its purpose is to keep people from having excuses and to show that the entire world is guilty before God. For no one can ever be made right by God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows how sinful we are. As Paul says to Timothy, scripture makes us realise what is wrong in our lives. Jesus was using the law to bring the man to repentance, to understand his need for forgiveness and that's still its purpose. He used the law to show what was right and wrong. I wonder, is the word of God the measure by which you decide what is right and wrong? The thing which gives you direction. Chat GPT's advice is typical of the world. You should weigh things up, you should consider others, but then you do what you feel is best. 
I'd like to suggest that something that I think or that I feel is best or right or true may not be. It should be, what does the Bible say? Because the Bible is not just a book, amazing as it is, it's the Word of God. And God knows better than me. Part of our Christian journey is realising who our new creation is. Our old self has gone. I want us to understand that this may come at a cost. I'd recommend you read the whole of 2 Timothy chapter 3 to put today's reading in context. But here's just a couple of verses, starting at verse 12. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil people and impostors will flourish. They will deceive others and will themselves be deceived. There's a little quiz for you. Does anybody recognise this lady? Anyone? Ah, Scottish, yeah, yeah. Her name is Kate Forbes. She is currently um, running to become the leader of the Scottish National Party, and so far the first, um, so the first minister of Scotland. I don't want to focus on the left or the right of politics, but the reason I'm using her as an example is because she is reported in the media, media as being a confessing Christian. I don't actually know very much about her theological stance on many things, but she is reported to not support same-sex marriages. She thinks that abortion is wrong. She thinks that a trans woman is a biological male who identifies as a woman, and so therefore you cannot change your gender. She does not approve of Scotland's gender recognition reform bill. She's opposed to sex before marriage, and childbirth before marriage. She has sh said that she gets these views from her Christian faith. And although she is one of the front runners, her views are generally not popular from within her party. And quite a few have now publicly withdrawn their previous support. I wonder, do you let the Bible shape your feelings about these issues, even if they are counter-cultural? <coughs> Here's another quiz. Who are these Bible teachers? Shout them out if you know. Who's that? J. John. J. John, well done. David Paulson. David Paulson. David Paulson. Yeah. Billy Graham. Billy Graham. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Guy and Hazel. Oh, come on. Okay, I wonder whether you have a favourite Christian teacher, perhaps within this church, or perhaps on YouTube or telly. Do you value listening to them, or reading their books as a way of deepening your faith, or understanding the Bible? I know that I do, but I want to say that there isn't one person whose theological stance is 100% accurate on everything, because we all have biases. Some matters, in fact many matters, are just small issues, but, and we can still have Christian unity, but some areas might be more significant. <clears throat> just before the passage we read in Colossians, Paul is warning about false teaching from within the church. In the Colossians case, it seems to be that the heresy that Paul is talking about is some form of Gnosticism. In verse 4 we read, I am telling you this so that no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. Whatever was being taught, it was appealing, convincing, well-crafted, but deceptive and wrong. It's a warning to us because something that is taught within a church building or in the name of Jesus, it doesn't necessarily, necessarily mean it is true and right. We mustn't put our favourite teacher on a pedestal and assume that everything they say is true. There can be two extremes here. In an effort to protect ourselves against false teachers, we could put our fingers in our ears and 
shut ourselves in the cupboard and not listen to anybody at all. But then we'd be completely unteachable. And remember, we're supposed to be devoted to Christ, but also to each other, having fellowship with one another. Or we can open our arms to absolutely everything. Anything that's got the word spirit in it must be a good thing. And it must have something to do with God. And we just want to get close to God. Rather, we need to test everything against God's word. Not just accept an idea of God that someone has created for us or that we've created for ourselves. Have you ever heard someone say, my Jesus wouldn't do that? Well, okay, but is your Jesus the real Jesus? Paul tells Timothy that scripture corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Do you test what you hear against the word of God? We're in such a privileged position to have the Bible accessible to us. It's on our phones, it's online, and I'm sure most of us have at least one copy in a bookshelf at home. It's our responsibility to check what we are taught against the scriptures. And that's the case if it's a famous YouTuber or someone in this church. And if I've got something wrong this morning, please come and tell me about it. But with love and grace, we're asked to speak the truth in love, and I am still very much learning. And what about those difficult passages that seem, well, a bit weird, or they sound a bit offensive to modern ears and go against the cultural brain? How do we approach them? Is our main concern to fit in not upset anybody? Or do you feel that because you are a follower of Christ and you believe that the word is, the Bible is the word of God, is it your desire to receive it fully, to try and understand it carefully and then to support it? Does that mean that all scripture is easy to understand? Uh, no. But don't forget that Paul says all scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us what is true. And that's the difficult stuff too. But be reassured, the gospel message, the stuff that's really important, is simple to understand. There's plenty that I will never fully understand on this earth, I'm sure. And that's okay. The key is, spend time reading it every day. Find a quiet place free of your phone and distractions and pray, asking the Holy Spirit if there's anything that you need to see afresh. And how do you decide what to read? Oh, wrong way, sorry. Well, there's lots of Bible reading guides out there. One that I personally use is this one called Wordline from Scripture Union. You can access it on their Facebook page, on their website, or you can sign up and have it emailed to, your, to you. Um, there's a short Bible passage, a short guide on how to pray, and a short reflection each day. What about those of us who find reading tricky? It's quite a big book after all. I don't mind telling you that I'm dyslexic, and I can find retaining what I've read quite a challenge. There's lots of audio Bibles out there, on apps. Bible Gateway also has audio versions and there's also something called the Lumo Project and what this is it has word for word scripture from the four gospels over film footage. But however you engage with God's word, pray. Is there anything in my life that needs to change? Because God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. Does anyone here find it difficult to remember chapter and verse? The details, the facts, the figures, the names? Well, that's okay because you are not being prepped for an exam. We are not part of the Bible Appreciation Society. Why else do we read God's word apart from knowing right and wrong, and to know what's true. 
It's to equip us to do every good work. Our knowledge of the Bible won't benefit us or other people unless it leads us to do the good work that God has in store for us, unless we allow the Holy Spirit to change us as we read it, unless we allow its words to change our hearts, our desires, our ambitions, our lives, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. Are we able to say like the psalmist in Psalm 119, your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path? I'm sure many of you are familiar with C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters, but for those who aren't, it's a fictional work that contains letters from a character called Screwtape, who's a senior demon, to his less experienced nephew called Wormwood, and their job is to discuss how to guide people from, uh, or oh, sorry, towards our father below, who is the devil, and away from the enemy, who is God. And here's a quote from the book. It says, how funny mortals always picture us as putting things into their minds. In reality, our best work is done by keeping things out. The Bible does contain objective moral statements, but it's not simply a rule book, a list of thou shalt nots. It's God's love letter to us. His plan to restore everything that was broken, and that includes us. But God cannot reveal his whole plan to you, his promises, his purposes, if we don't read all about it. I want to end by showing you this photograph that was taken on one of our favourite beaches. We were sat and I noticed a cross on the top. And I commented this to James, ah, oh, that's nice, like it was a decoration. And James looked at me a little strange and said, um, dear, I think it's a signpost, not a cross. <laughs> How do you view the Bible? Do you see it as a pretty book with gold edges, nicely decorating your bookshelf? Do you see it as something that thou shalt read? Or do you see it as something alive, active, giving direction of how you should live, revealing the truth of who God is and understanding who you are in Christ. And here's your challenge for this week. Reflect on what the Bible is to you in light of today's teaching. Let's just end with a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. Please help us all to treasure it more deeply over this week. And as we spend time reading it, please reveal something afresh of yourself. Maybe we be open to challenge, encouragement, and guider and guidance. Help us to be truly rooted in your word, individually and as a church. <clears throat>